Welcome and thank you for joining part five of SciFarth's micro webinar series, The Future Starts Now, Future of Work for New England Employers. This installment of the series will focus on pay equity and transparency. All participants are in listen only mode. You are encouraged to submit questions throughout the program using the Q&A feature in WebEx. However, if your question is not answered, our presenters will follow up with you in directly in the days ahead. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees following the presentation. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Barry Miller. Barry, you may begin. Thanks, Brooke. And thanks to all of you for joining us for our micro webinar series on pay equity and pay transparency. I'm Barry Miller, and presenting with me today is Chris Kelleher. Both of us are employment lawyers in Seifarth Straw's Boston office, and both of us have an interest in wage and hour work uh, within the employment sphere. And the reason that we've selected this topic to include in the Future of Work series is that issues pertaining to pay equity and pay transparency are likely the biggest change we're going to see in the wage and hour space over the next few years. We've seen a significant tide of legislation in this space at the state and even the local level, which really transforms employers' obligations relative to paying people equitably and to reporting information about how they pay for particular jobs. We see two broad trends within this rising tide of legislation. One of them is a set of laws that require what's typically called pay transparency, which is some sort of disclosure to the world at large or potentially to a pool of employees or applicants about what an employer intends to pay for a specific position. The other is a set of legislative initiatives that are directed at comparing the compensation of women to men or in some cases uh, minority to non-minority employees. And the number and nature of obligations that an organization has under these new laws um, is a little bit daunting. So we're going to go through a few things that are currently in place in terms of pay equity and pay transparency requirements. And we're also going to focus on the future by looking at some pending legislation here in Massachusetts, which is likely to pass in the next few weeks. And we'll wrap it up with a discussion of some strategies for employers to follow as they begin to navigate these issues. Uh, you see here an agenda for the points we intend to cover. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris to talk about the Massachusetts pay equity law. Thanks, Barry. And uh, Brooke, you can go to the next slide there. Um, so um, the Massachusetts Equal Pay Act, we thought we'd give you a little bit of a foundation because, you know, the pay transparency law that, that will likely be passed uh, sort of builds on, on the Massachusetts Equal Pay Act, or MEPA, as we call it. And, Brooke, you, you, you can um, go back one slide there if you want. Um, we thought, uh, so Massachusetts Equal Pay Act, it's, you know, loosely based on the federal Equal Pay Act. Um, but but it's it's a bit more strict and re, and, and and imposes uh, uh, more of a burden on employers. The Federal Equal Pay Act uh, prohibits wage discrimination based on sex, as many of you likely know. And employers cannot pay employees um, of different sexes uh, differently for the same work. Um, so it's sort of narrow in that it requires equal pay for equal work, and the jobs being compared must be must be, require substantially equal skill effort or responsibility. Um, the, the, um, uh, the work in, under the federal law must be performed under similar working conditions and within the same establishment. So it's defensible, uh, it's somewhat forgiving for employers, uh, and there's a defense uh, where employers can explain pay differences based on any factor other than sex, which you'll see in a moment uh, is not, uh, does not exist in, in MEPA. Uh, so MEPA came about in 2018, and it states that employers cannot pay, employ, uh, pay workers less than what they would pay an employee of a different gender for comparable work. So rather than the equal work standard, we're looking at a comparable work standard, which I'll discuss on the next slide. So comparable work um, is defined as work that requires substantially similar skill, 
effort and responsibility and is performed under similar working conditions. Uh, note, however, that a, a title or job description alone does not determine comparability. So, for example, you could have, uh, you know, two employees with the same or similar job titles who are not doing comparable work for purposes of MEPA. Uh, you could also have pe two different, uh, two people with different job titles who are comparable for purposes of MEPA. So, while job titles are some evidence uh, as to whether an individual or two individuals are performing comparable work, uh, it doesn't get you all the way there. Uh, it's really a sort of a case-by-case case and fact-intensive analysis. Uh, and the comparable work standard uh, requires that the work uh, is done in similar uh, working conditions. Um, in, in similar working conditions um, are not limited, as the federal law states, to the same establishment. So similar uh, working conditions includes, you know, the environment and other, circum other similar circumstances uh, that are custom customarily taken into consideration in setting salary or wages. And this includes, but is not limited to, reasonable shift differentials and the physical surroundings and hazards uh, encountered by employees in performing jobs. Um, exceptions, so there are a, a limited number of exceptions to, um, to liability under MEPA, and uh, pay differentials uh, among employees of different genders are only permitted if you can establish one of these six factors. Um, and note that the, any factor other than sex defense is, is not one of them. Uh, the factors that are permitted under MEPA that, that, that permit um, differences in pay are a system that rewards seniority with the employer, um, but note that time spent on leave due to pregnancy or uh, family medical leave uh, cannot affect that seniority. Uh, next factor is an established merit system, uh, a system that measures earnings by quantity or quality of production, sales, or revenue, uh, geographic location, so where a job is performed. You might pay an employee more in a large city than in a smaller city, for instance. Uh, education, training, or experience uh, that are reasonably related to the job. So that's that's the important aspect of the fifth uh, factor. Um, you know, you, it's it's permissible to pay employees uh, more based on education, training, or experience, but you must be able to show uh, that such education, training, experience is reasonably related to doing the job. So. You know, you might you might pay more for a college degree, but it, if it if it comes out in discovery that a college degree isn't really necessary for a particular position, um, that you know it might not be defensible under MEPA. And then finally, the last uh, exception is um, you 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 might pay more uh, to an employee for travel, as long as that travel is a regular and necessary uh, condition of the job. So. Especially in the post-pandemic world, you know, we, we need to think about uh, is the travel does the travel add value? Um, uh, what you know, what is that value? Could you know, could the job be done remotely? Um, those are the types of questions you know you might be asking. Um, there hasn't been much litigation, so it's you know the law was passed in 2018. We've seen a very little bit of litigation, but not much. So you know the the, the terms in the comparable work standard. And as you'll see on the next page, um, the terms in the in the um, affirmative defense are really not well defined. And so um, Barry will touch on the the um, conducting an audit. You know, I'll go to the next page. Um, conducting audits and and how to do that uh, the best way to be compliant. But courts really haven't haven't provided a lot of guidance um, or interpretation for this law. Um, so the good faith audit defense, MEPA, this is a really important aspect of MEPA. There's a complete affirmative defense for any employer who, within the previous three years, completes uh, a uh, uh, or conducts a reasonable self-evaluation of its pay practices. So this is a, a pay equity audit, essentially. Um, pay equity audits should be, you know, privileged to maintain confidentiality rather than a non-privileged internal audit. And Barry will go into that in a couple minutes as well. Uh, but to be eligible for the, the complete affirmative defense under, under MEPA, uh, the, the pay audit must be reasonable in detail and scope and must also show reasonable progress toward eliminating any impermissible gender-based wage differences uh, that the self-evaluation may reveal. So there's, there's, not, there's not one way to do it, but, and it may, may be of the employer's own design. 
as long as it's reasonable in detail in scope. And that's in light of the size of the employer. So, you know, if you're a national employer, uh, you need to think about, you know, the comparable work standard, uh, which, which employees might be comparable, how do we group these employees, and, and who do we include within our audit. So those, those are all things to think about. Uh, importantly, evidence of the self-audit is not admissible as a violation uh, if, it, if it occurred before uh, the filing of a lawsuit. So uh, the state really wants to encourage uh, these, these audits and provides a, a big incentive for employers to avoid liability by conducting them. Next slide, please, Brooke. So we can move into trends in pay transparency laws, and you can go back one, uh, uh, Brooke. Um, uh, pay, pay transparency laws, as Barry touched on at the top, uh, they sort of expand upon laws requiring equal pay among employees of different sexes or, in some cases, um, uh, different races or other protected categories. Uh, pay transparency laws require, generally require employers to provide uh, pay range information for certain positions to applicants and in some instances to employees, either upon uh, a reasonable request by the person or in job postings or job advertisements. And we can go to the next one, Brooke. So we thought since this was sort of a New England focused uh, presentation, we'd list um, some of the recent pay transparency laws that have been passed, and Barry will talk at a second, in a second about the, the, the impending Massachusetts law. Uh, but you'll see on the screen here that uh, a number of uh, Northeast states have passed pay transparency laws uh, in the past few years. And that's, you know, around the country, um, states and cities around the country have been, have been passing these laws. Two of the more aggressive um, laws are in Colorado and Washington. Um, and I wanted to note those for you. Employers in Colorado must include compensation in job postings, notify employees of promotion opportunities, and keep job description and wage records for two years after the end of employment. Uh, and Colorado uh, takes the position that it applies to any entity employing at least one employee in Colorado and um, also takes a position that it applies to any job that could be performed remotely in the U.S. So Colorado essentially says, if you you know if you can perform a job uh, remotely, perhaps from perhaps uh, from Colorado, uh, you'll be subject to the Colorado law. Um, so that's led some employers to to in their job postings say you know this job is open to anyone except uh, individuals who live in Colorado. Uh, to which Colorado has responded that you know that that's not that's not compliant with the law. So. Uh, interesting to see what's going on in Colorado, and Washington has taken a step further. Uh, it's got a similar law. It requires uh, employers to disclose in each uh, uh, posting for a job opening the pay range and a general description of all benefits and other compensation to be offered, and this includes any job postings that recruit Washington-based employees. It includes employers that do not have a physical presence in Washington if they have one or more employee, uh, uh, Washington-based employee, or if they engage in business in Washington or recruit for jobs that could be filled remotely from Washington. So this is uh, sort of a step broader uh, and more strict than Colorado, or um, as you'll see on the screen, um, you know, Connecticut uh, requires disclosure of salary ranges to applicants and employees. Uh, note that the Connecticut legislature recently proposed a new law that re would require employers to disclose ranges in all job postings. Um, New York City uh, requires uh, employers in uh, advertisements to include a good faith salary range for every job, promotion, and transfer, and that implies to employers with four or more employees, uh, but they don't need to work in the same location and they don't need to all work in New York City as long as at least one person does. Uh, you'll see that Rhode Island has a law that went into effect January of this year. Um, uh, employers may not prohibit employees to inquire about wage, range, wage ranges. And New York State also has a law that uh, largely tracks the New York City law with, with some minor differences. So uh, why don't I turn over to Barry now to uh, discuss Massachusetts looming pay transparency and paid data reporting law. Thanks, Chris. I kind of catches us up as to where we are, and so the next question is, where are we going? And we have some pending legislation in Massachusetts uh, 
that is likely to move the Commonwealth kind of into the pack that Chris just described. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, Massachusetts was an early mover in this tide of legislation that I talked about at the beginning of the program. It was one of the first states to implement what I might call a modern pay equity law in 2018. And in some ways, Massachusetts was uh, even more an early mover than that. Uh, MEPA is actually a 1940s era statute, and it was initially passed to prevent women from displacing men who had been called off to war in the workforce because employers at that time could get away with paying women more. And it's interesting that without a great deal of change to the legislative language, the purpose of the statute is now almost exactly the opposite. Um, but since MEPA was passed in 2018, Massachusetts has kind of fallen behind the pack. Uh, the comparable work standard that Chris mentioned and the defense for a pay equity analysis were brand new. Uh, Massachusetts was an innovator in that regard, but at the time MEPA passed, you didn't have these pay transparency laws in other states. And we now see uh, the Massachusetts legislature beginning to catch up and take notice of that trend. And in each of the last several legislative sessions, there have been proposals for various forms of pay transparency laws. Um, there are many bills that have been floated, both in terms of formal proposals and informal drafts that have been circulating on Beacon Hill for a few years. And up to this point, none of them has made it to a vote. And that is not because there's any political debate over whether these laws are a good idea. Um, MEPA passed unanimously. No one voted against it, and the two major lobby groups for employers in Massachusetts both came out in favor of that bill. We're seeing essentially the same pattern around pay transparency. So it's not a question of whether this is going to happen. It's a question of the details and exactly what this new bill may include. And there are a wide variety of proposals on the table some of which are modest in the context of the law is already in place in other states, and some of them are brand new uh, and include some very interesting features. Uh, our sources on the Hill tell us this is likely to be passed before July, before the July recess, and is likely to be effective regardless of its specific terms, January 1, 2024, so it's right on the horizon. All of the proposals, of course, define the employers that are subject to the new legislation, and most of them use this term, covered employers. There are two uh, posts that you see in these legislative proposals. You see a number of bills that have a threshold of 15 employees, which would capture virtually every employer in Massachusetts, and you see some that have a 100 employee threshold, which would exclude at least the smallest uh, businesses in the Commonwealth. Um, what I'm hearing suggests to me that the number is likely to be 15 and not 100, which would mean virtually everyone is going to be affected. Um, one proposal or one component that is common to all of the bills that I've seen, including those formally on file, is a pay transparency law that, are, that is similar to the several that Chris described a few minutes ago. And within that range of laws, there are different definitions of what a pay range is. As Chris noted, the Washington bill requires disclosures of incentive compensation, benefits, and almost every statute has its own articulation. The bill that is in circulation, several of the bills in circulation, use the language quoted here on the slide, which is a definition of a pay range that constitutes what an employer reasonably and in good faith expects to pay for such a position. And that's a middle road definition. It doesn't put great onus on the employer to get it exactly right. It doesn't require a full disclosure of the pay range that might be applicable to the position. It doesn't create an issue if an employer pays outside that range and has a good reason for doing so. It's very much a middle of the road proposal in that regard. Um, like many of the pending statutes, it uh, applies to any posting or advertising for a job. And essentially what that would mean is anywhere you post a position, what you'd have to include alongside the title and qualifications is some description of the pay range. Most of the competing proposals also require that a pay range be disclosed upon request to employees who currently hold a given position. And some of those drafts also apply to applicants. 
So somebody who was applying for a job could ask for the pay range in that context, and you'd have to give it to them even if there had been no formal publication of any posting or any pay range. And like virtually all employment litigation or legislation rather, these bills all prohibit retaliation for anybody uh, or against anybody who has exercised any rights under the statute, including, for example, requesting a pay range. So those aspects of the bills currently um, under discussion are not radical, not um, particularly unusual in the context of the larger pay equity and pay transparency trends we see, but it does get more interesting from there. So we can go to the next slide. Some of the proposals now on the table include a significant pay data reporting provision, which is an entirely different thing. We currently have two states that have similar legislation. One is California, the other is Illinois. And in both cases, employers are required to submit fairly hefty uh, bundles of data to the state each year that is in some way connected to pay equity type issues. And there are several concerns that arise from that sort of proposal. One is it's just very onerous. We've worked with a lot of employers uh, who have folks on the ground in California and Illinois, and the simple process of submitting this data is more than a little clunky, in part because it's all brand new. But we've seen employers, at least in certain sectors, really struggle with how their data needs to be wrangled and submitted. So that, of course, is a concern. Another concern is what is going to be done with any data that is submitted to the state. Um, there are concerns in Illinois and California about what might be disclosed about how an employer pays its employees. And in Illinois in particular, there are some significant guardrails. Uh, one could debate whether they're sufficient, but there are at least guardrails there to prevent disclosure of compensation information that might even enable an outside party to learn some information through the process of elimination about the compensation of particular employees with your, within your organization, which is obviously very concerning. And all of that is exacerbated by the fact that the sort of data that the government is asking uh, for folks to submit in this context actually does very little to inform any sort of pay equity or uh, pay transparency sort of analysis. It's happenstance data for each employer, and there's no larger body uh, against which to compare the data that a given employer might submit. So when you start from that premise and you look at the potential exposure of very sensitive information, some folks are very concerned about this. And we see this proposal in only some of the bills that are currently being circulated. It seems to be much less uh, certain to occur than the pay transparency points that I mentioned a few minutes ago. But the basic idea is that you would report essentially the same data on your EEO-1 form where you're delineating different types of workers, executives, sales folks, laborers, and um, dividing the, the employees in your complement by gender or race into those various different tiers. Um, some of the bills also require disclosure of gender identity, uh, which is a feature of the California law as well an additional comp complication because many employers don't track that. It's just not something that's necessarily built into the HRIS system. So it's one more thing that uh, has to be navigated. And some of these proposals would require more detailed information, including a separate disclosure of employees by race and gender that is broken down into pay bands established by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And one proposal even required the Secretary of the Commonwealth to post alongside a corporation's annual corporate filings this information that would be submitted in conjunction with this pay data reporting process, which is concerning, of course. Um, the enforcement mechanisms for all of these pending bills are pretty well aligned, and that's some good news. Uh, unlike a lot of Massachusetts wage and hour legislation, this is not something that's going to expose an employer to trouble damages. There's no private right of action, so you shouldn't see class action litigation brought by folks pursuing opportunistic claims. Instead, enforcement is entrusted exclusively to the Attorney General, and it's built into many of these proposals that every employer essentially gets one free get-out-of-jail-free card. Uh, the, the first offense is always to be met with a warning, which is uh, an enforcement feature that we see in the New York City context as well, 
And that's been some comfort. It provides a little cushion for folks. But after that first warning comes and goes, the penalties for violations can get pretty steep, especially for intentional violations, where you might see the attorney general fine an employer $10,000 or more per posting if it's not compliant with the statute. So let's move on to the next feature of these bills. And this one is truly innovative. This is found nowhere else in the United States. Uh, some of the bills currently being circulated deal with a pipeline promotional opportunities fund. And the way it would work is covered employers, as previously discussed, would be required to report annually on the ratio of women and minorities in so-called senior positions. And there's a definition of that in the proposed legislation that would include the titles you would expect, EVPs, SVPs, CEOs, that sort of thing and would also call on the Department of Labor to annually issue a document that further described what that means, senior positions. Then once the individual reports from employers were in, the Department of Labor would aggregate that data and publish information about the representation of women and minorities in general in senior positions in six different metropolitan statistical areas. And once that occurred, an employer that had a ratio below the average for its statistical area would be able to provide an opportunity to its employees to pursue funding for professional development and coaching to enhance their prospects for promotion and advance the gender and racial parity of the employer. Um, there are many details absent from this proposal. There's no description of what that development and coaching might look like and what criteria might narrow sorts of training opportunities that one could pursue. For example, can I join a country club and improve my golf swing in hopes of being promoted into a senior position? Not clear from this current um, draft. It's also not clear whether only women and minorities could pursue these sorts of funds. That obviously raises all kinds of discrimination issues. Um, and it might be one reason that you don't see this proposal in many of the bills being put forward now it's just, it's very new. It includes a lot of controversial pieces, but it's definitely out there and something to keep your eye on. So now that we've talked about those potential future developments, I just wanted to say a few words about what employers might do by way of compliance strategies. So we could skip ahead a couple of slides, Brooke. While we skip, Brooke, I'll read out the CLE code. It's um, SS as in Cypher Shaw 7264 SS. 7264. Thanks, Chris. And we've got a few high level ideas. Obviously, this is a micro webinar. We're not getting into details on any of this, but we wanted to advance the, the sort of things you should be thinking about given the legislation that we're likely to face in the next several weeks, months, and potentially years. And the first thing that every employer needs to do is really get its compensation game in order. We need to make sure that we have ranges of pay for internal purposes, oftentimes called salary bands, that align with how we're actually paying people. Oftentimes when we start doing pay equity reviews for folks and we look at their existing infrastructure, they tell us, yeah, these pay bands are a little outdated, they're not quite right. And that's something that needs to be addressed in order to really even begin uh, any sort of response to this pay transparency and pay equity trend. And you need to make sure that out there in the field, your hiring managers are living by those ranges and hiring people in a way that is aligned with the organization's compensation strategy so that you don't have outliers that are skewing how the compensation looks in a data review. You need to start thinking also about a general strategy for your disclosure about pay range information. Most employers that operate in more than one state are going to have different obligations to which they're subject, as Chris discussed. Uh, described. So you need to think about, are you going to disclose an entire pay band? Are you going to narrow a target range and say, here's the midpoint and we expect to pay plus or minus 25% around the midpoint? There are lots of potential good answers to that question. You just need to figure out which one works best for your organization. And you need to think about how folks are going to react when this data begins to be published. Because what we've seen in many states is when these salary ranges are posted and job postings are elsewhere, current incumbent candidates see that, see where they lay within the range, 
and uh, trouble can bubble up from there. So you need to think ahead about how you're going to deal with those issues and what you're going to say to people who raise those points. And the next thing that is pretty critical to do for almost any employer at this point is a pay equity review of the sort that Chris described. We do those in a robust statistical way, typically through a multivariate regression, and that gives you all kinds of leverage in this conversation that you otherwise don't have. It gives you the affirmative defense that Chris described. It provides a pressure test to inform the extent to which your existing compensation infrastructure is working and whether your pay bands are appropriately calibrated. It provides you an opportunity to fix things before you have to disclose all of this information about your employee complement. And it gives you individual level employee information that you can use when you respond to any inquiries that may come from your employees as all of these things continue to percolate. And with that, we can go to our last substantive slide. And the other thing that folks should be thinking about with these disclosure laws coming up is how they will look if and when they're required to provide this information to the government. You can look at your federal EEO-1 filings from the last few years and think about how you would feel if that was disclosed publicly and whether there are things that you may want to do to promote some balance among the various positions that are described there. You may also want to think about the ratio of women and minorities in senior positions, because that seems to be a target area that the legislature is going to pursue in the next little bit. And before you need to disclose to the world those sorts of ratios, it's worth looking at them yourself to see how they look. And think about the message that you want to send in publishing any data. Uh, and that might include a description of other diversity initiatives or internal promotional initiatives that the company is pursuing to put all of the hard data in context and provide a little softer feel to it than the hard numbers might. And then the last point in light of this pipeline program that I described is think about whether it's possible to turn some of these compliance burdens into opportunities and whether there are folks in your organization who are natural leadership candidates who might benefit from that sort of pipeline arrangement. Um, one disclaimer that goes with that is you need to be very aware of self-help there. Um, providing opportunities to people based on either their gender, race, or ethnicity obviously is fraught with discrimination risk, so that should be done with the advice of counsel but it's something that is worth thinking about as this landscape continues to evolve very rapidly. That does cover our material for today. Thank you for joining us in this uh, lightning round format. If you have questions about any of these developments or strategies for complying with them, you have our contact information, and of course, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much for joining us.